Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, the Nashville Needle Pointer, Lita O'Hara. Lita, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we have questions. All right. The first question is, you have somewhere written down, patron saint of chaos. You can't put <laughs> that down without explaining. <laughs> of course. So I think... Unfortunately, I don't have kind of these big grand plans. I do a lot of things just kind of spur of the moment. And a lot of the things I do, I realize kind of were stressing out my followers. So, for example, I would have a canvas and, you know, decide I'm going to finish it. I've never finished anything like it before. I'm not going to practice on a blank canvas. I'm just going to cut into it and do it. And um, I guess generationally, that is just something that, many people call chaotic. And so um, I just want people to know ahead of time what to expect because sometimes people will see that and just get very stressed out. And unfortunately, it's just kind of par for the course with me. Hmm. <laughs> so you don't, you don't plan. You just say, hey, I think I've got this idea. Let's go for it. Exactly. And, you know, some days I may wake up and decide that I need to paint my bedroom or um, other days I'll wake up and decide that I need to paint a line of canvases. So there's no kind of rhyme or reason. It is just whatever I feel inspired to do that day. And sometimes that can be a little difficult to keep up with. <laughs> Seems fun to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah. All right, the finishing, we're going to get to the finishing, but the stitching, when, how do you come to be a stitcher? Yeah, so my story is probably very similar to that of many people in my generation in that when the pandemic hit, I was home <laughs> alone. There it is again, every time. Anxious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, when we were working, we were going out, we were living our lives just so filled to the brim with work that there really wasn't any time for anything else, no hobbies, nothing like that. And I think with the pandemic for a lot of people in my generation, it's the first time that we really slowed down and kind of had time to ourselves again. And so I was just sitting on the couch, you know, binge watching Netflix and <laughs> I saw my sorority sister, she had posted to her personal Instagram that she used to needlepoint when she was younger because her mom was an avid stitcher. And so she said, you know, if anyone's interested, let me know. I'll send you a little beginner kit. I'd love to get more people interested. And so immediately I was like, yes, like I've been needlepoint curious for so long. I definitely want to try it. But I was a little hesitant because, you know, the prices can be very high. And so if it's something that you haven't done before, it can be kind of a large investment to jump in. But she was so kind. She sent me a little starter kit and it was just um, a piece of canvas with a rectangle drawn on it and one skein of variegated thread. And then she sent me a link to a YouTube video and she said, try it. You know, if you like it, you can kind of expand to other canvases. But if you aren't enjoying the motion of it, then you're not really going to enjoy, you know, stitching those really beautiful um hand painted canvases so you know just work to get the motion down that's a great way to start though with just a yeah. variegated floss and a little piece of canvas i never thought of teaching someone that way mm -hmm. and i finished it into a bookmark i gave it to my husband he still uses it to this day and it just it created you know just like a pretty kind of rainbow pattern um but it was just enough to make me feel accomplished but not so much that i was overwhelmed Needlepoint Curious. I'm, I wrote that one down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The um, Does Needlepoint Curious mean you have just always been interested or have long been interested in needlework? or? Yeah, so I've just always been the type of person that likes to have her hands busy. When I was younger, I used to do a lot of sewing. And embroidery, I would say, is something that was always interesting to me because it just looked so intricate and beautiful um that it was always something I wanted to do and then with needlepoint specifically I love that it kind of almost has a built-in guide so you know where you're going and what you're doing where whereas 
with embroidery, it was a little bit less guided. And so as a beginner, I was a little intimidated by that. Yeah, that is the, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the people who work on canvas and then go to needle to embroidery. It's like, uh Oh, <laughs> where do I put the needle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So, okay. So then, uh, as you, uh, all this pandemic, I'll tell you, it's going to be a factor, uh, for a long time. So, then does that lead you to painted canvas or how, how did you progress from that initial piece? Yes. Yeah, so I saw a bunch of designs that I loved and I ordered a few canvases, but I quickly realized that it, I was stitching faster than my budget would allow. And so <laughs> I was like, I have to find another way to create canvases that I want to stitch um, that maybe is a little bit easier on my pocketbook. So that's what drew me to painting some of my own designs, mainly, you know, personal designs. Um, and I will say my first painted canvases were atrocious. <laughs> um, I had no idea what kind of paints to use. I was using brushes that were way too big. I didn't realize you were supposed to paint on the intersection. Um, so it's definitely a learning experience, but really I would say one of those kind of um, trial by fire situation. So I have it figured out now, but there was quite a bit of improvement required to get here. I'm, I'm so, guessing so you just... a, a lot of filled holes and dripped paint on the table. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you just dove in. You didn't, you didn't even think twice, take a class, just said, Hey, I can do this. I did watch a lot of YouTube videos, um, but yeah, at the time, you know, classes weren't really an option because we, um, at that point, very kind of near the start of the pandemic, it was still a lot of isolation, a lot of social distancing. Um, right. So even if I knew of a place I could have taken a class, unfortunately, they just weren't being offered at that time. Oh, right, right. That pandemic. <laughs> yeah. So do you have an art background that helped you with this or did you start just start with simple shapes and words I just started with simple shapes and words honestly my degree is in economics and political science um as you can imagine that is something that I use daily um, <laughs> so I'm glad I spent four years working on that but um you know I just I wish I had an art background unfortunately I don't but I know what I like and kind of what I want to see. And so I try my best to create things that I personally would like, but I, you know, I feel like that journey varies so much for every single person. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so the, the painted canvas, do you, you have you done them to sell? Uh, do you continue to do them? How is that playing out? Yeah. So I mainly just paint canvases for myself. Every okay. once in a while, someone will see a design I like and ask if they can buy one. If I have the capacity, I'm happy to paint one for other people. But at this time, I didn't want to mass produce canvases. I was really just focused on kind of things that I personally enjoy and would want to stitch. I do make charts that I will share occasionally, and those I typically will share for free because part of my goal is to... Um, maybe reduce some of the barriers to entry into needlepoint and just kind of make it a little bit more accessible for the general public. You know, as I mentioned, when I first started, I was overstitching my budget. And so that was like a limiting factor in my ability to grow and love the hobby. And so every once in a while now I will make charts so that people can a practice painting on their own and b you know, have a free design that, you know, it isn't stolen, it was given freely that they can enjoy stitching and kind of practice and maybe find the same love in needlepoint that I found. Yeah, folks, buy your own. Quick, don't copyright, don't do it. Yep, yeah. Buy your own. Yep. So have you tried counted canvas as a, a way to have more affordable needle? Because that's that is the trouble with painted canvas is mm -hmm. is yeah, it can get darn expensive in a hurry and uh especially if you're stitching a lot, you can yeah, you can eat through some dollars. Uh have you tried counted canvas? Is that so at, at all appealing or is it the painted that you like? So I prefer painted and part of painting for me is going from, you know, counting the canvas and then 
painting it. Um, but I don't like counter canvas while I'm actually stitching because I find that I'm too easily distracted and I will lose my count and just not know where I started or stopped. And so for me, I'd rather take the time to sit down and actually paint the design and just mm. have my focus solely be on painting it. So that way when I'm stitching it, I can focus on my stitching, um, you know, the colors, shading, or honestly, it's something I do while I'm watching TV, while I'm listening to audiobooks. And so by not having to count, I can kind of enjoy those activities a little bit more while I'm going through the motions of stitching. Yeah. See, so it helps to have those boundaries there. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so that, uh, that continues. Are, are you, uh, uh, large pieces, small pieces? So I'm very guilty. I always buy large pieces because I have large aspirations. Mm. Um, but realistically, I think most of the things I stitch are maybe ornament sized or smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I, just realize that I love that gratification when you finish a piece. And um, unfortunately with large canvases, that is a bit more delayed. So I have found so many beautiful designs that I definitely want to stitch, but um, it's just so difficult because those little, you know, quick, quick, I use in quotes because of course needlepoint isn't quick, but um, those sooner gratification pieces are the ones I kind of tear to stitch. So how did the uh, pandemic sorority sister needlepoint thing pan out? Were you the only one that picked up on it? Oh, gosh, no. She sent it to several people. Um, they are all stitchers. And, in fact, I would say it's almost like a phone tree. You know, she uh -huh. got me interested. I got one of my other sisters interested, and then she passed it on. And so I would say, you know, for every new person who takes it up, they're probably introducing it to five to seven more people. Ooh, a positive pandemic. All right. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yay. So how, do, how, does the, how does the finishing come in? It was, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you do these things. Yeah, I got to actually do something with them. Uh, did you teach yourself that too, or...? I did. Yes and no. So I have, you know, kind of that sewing background. I used to make clothes. Um, when I was younger, my mother was a single mother. And so I would go to work with her a lot. But in doing that, I had to find a corner to sit quietly out of the way. And so I did a lot of beading, a lot of hand sewing as a kid. Granted, these pieces were all atrocious because I was, you know, <laughs> 10. Um, but it was something I could quietly do in the corner and still have that fun creative aspect while not bothering anyone else. So as I got older, I still had those skills that I honed when I was younger. And so as I stitched my pieces, I realized that the finishing turnaround times were just so long. Yeah. And if I wanted something back quickly, a, it wasn't going to happen unless I did it myself and then B with the pricing, you know, I already mentioned that I had overstitched my budget. So there was no budget left for finishing. Um, and then so kind of the combination of those two things, I was like, well, I did everything else. And I have always been the type of person to like to take things apart, see how they're done. You know, let me see if I can do it. I'm only going to practice on my pieces. So if it gets ruined, it'll be sad, but it's only me that's going to be heartbroken. Um, and so eventually I watched a few YouTube videos. I kind of played around with it and then eventually figured out the best way. But it, I would say it did take me a couple of years to get to the point where I felt comfortable finishing something that wasn't, you know, just for me. Yeah, that, uh, that is, uh, that is the big, the big leap I would believe is finishing something that somebody else stitched for them. Yeah. That's, um, <laughs> Yeah, the heart starts to race, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when you're cutting that canvas, um, which, mm. of course, is the first step. And so it's like, well, there's no turning back now. This is, <laughs> you know, where we're going full speed ahead. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so when you stitch, do you stitch in hand or do you stitch in a, like, a frame? So I prefer to stitch on a frame. Um, 
I probably have the worst posture, but I like to put the bottom of the frame on my stomach and then hold the top with my left hand and then stitch with my right. Um, I also will use a stand every once in a while, but I just find it easier for me because stitching in a hand, I have trouble keeping the tension where I want it. And so for me, it's bars, but I, I know people who have done kind of both. And the reason I'm asking is because once you got into finishing, does it make a difference? Can you tell if someone's stitched on bars versus stitched in hand when you're going to finish a piece? Yes, absolutely. Um, And that's not to say that I think one is better than the other, because I do think that it is a hobby. And if stitching on bars would mean that you aren't enjoying it, then it defeats the purpose of it being a hobby But I definitely can tell when something is stitched in hand because it tends to need a little bit more blocking. Um, And the canvas, I would say, is a little bit softer. It's more kind of broken in. Right, right. I understand what you're saying because people generally roll it as they stitch. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, breaks that whatever that is that keeps it nice and stiff when you're um, stitching on a a stretcher bars. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the starch starch gets worn out of it. I think it is starch, isn't it? Some form, yeah. I think so. No. And I mean, blocking is available, and I often will block pieces that get sent to me. But from a finishing standpoint, I definitely prefer to finish something that was stitched on bars. But again, at the end of the day, it's a hobby, and you have to enjoy it. Um, and so, you know. If you are an avid hand stitcher and that's what makes you happy, then do it, you know, pay for the blocking. As long as you know what you're getting into ahead of time, I think it's perfectly fine. So how yeah. did the, how did this progress then for you? you? You did your own pieces and then friends say, can you finish one of mine? And Yep. So that is exactly it. So I did my own and people would ask me like, oh, would you mind finishing My pieces, my sorority sister, the one that actually um, sent me that beginner kit, she asked if I would finish some of hers. And I was like, well, you know, I can't guarantee the quality quite yet because I'm still working and practicing. And she's like, no, I totally understand. Um, It's just the stuff that you've done so far does look pretty good. So I would be comfortable with it. So I was very grateful that she had that faith in me. And so I said, "Okay, well, you know, let me finish your pieces. I'm not going to charge you. Um, because I can't, you know, guarantee that final product. I will try my best. I will treat it as if it is, you know, a a paying finish. Um, and so she was so kind. She gave me all her pieces, let me work on them. I think she was, she ended up being happy with the final pieces. Um, but that gave me kind of the practice I needed for various different shapes and sizes because before I was only working on things that I had stitched which was limiting because, you know, realistically, I was only finishing a new piece every week or so. So it's not like I had a big pile that I could finish. She finishes, and then, she finishes pieces as fast as you and I, Beth. Wow. <laughs> that is such a joke. Okay, maybe not. We're slower than molasses. It takes yeah. us years to finish a piece. <laughs> Detail oriented, I would say, is the word. Let me make a note of that too. Yeah. Oh, detail oriented. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. That. That's 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 a sell right there. So, yeah. So well, as you're working on these things, do you is is there a point where you say, "Hey, I think I I'm confident enough I could actually charge people for this"? Yeah. So it did get to a point where I, you know, felt comfortable. I felt that I had honed my skills. So the last thing I wanted to do was offer services when I didn't feel that they were up to par. And I will say that I've noticed kind of a trend of um, direct-to-consumer finishers who maybe are offering finishing services when they could maybe use a little bit more practice. (laughs) Um, And that's not to say everyone. It is a very wide range. But I wanted to make sure that if I was being paid to finish something, I would be happy receiving that piece personally. And so after finishing my friend's piece um, for free for a couple of years, I then started to take on a small group of people. Um, I am not a public finisher, unfortunately. Um, I only work with a small clientele. 
uh, they send me more than enough to keep me busy, but it allows me to guarantee, you know, both quality and turnaround times, which I think are maybe the two trickiest things when it comes to finishing. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's the thing, you know, it, it, most finishers, well, actually, every, I think every single one of the finishers that, uh, that we've talked to, uh, almost are overwhelmed on a constant basis with, with work to do and, uh, really battle to keep up and especially mm-hmm. when Christmas shows up. So, um, so, so far you've been able to manage that then. Yeah. And I would say, unfortunately, you know, my client list is maybe 10 to 15 people that I work with on a regular basis. And that is more than enough to keep me as busy as I want to be. Um, And so if you think about the number of finishers there are, if realistically they can only handle, let's say, 20 to 30 uh, clients per year, that leaves a huge gap between pieces that need to be finished and available finishers. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I know the demand for uh, finishers. There was, uh, in one of the Facebook groups the other day, somebody just, you know, does anybody know a finisher who doesn't have a backlog that's for months so yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it's Mm -hmm. um if you have the skill and the time it's a place to go that's for sure definitely and i like working with my small group because you know i have all their phone numbers so when the package arrives i can text them say hey like your finishing has been delivered because they're or your canvases because there's no worse feeling than sending something off and just having no idea what's going on with it you know it is just in the void is it going to be returned? <laughs> Hopefully, but I don't know if it was even delivered, you know? Right. And so right. I love that we have that relationship and they can text me and say, Hey, like I'm going to have, you know, 14 canvases to send you. Um, I'd like it back by Christmas. What is the latest that I can get it to you? And so because it's a small group, I know that they're reliable. I know they're going to send those canvases so I can guarantee that work will show up. And so I can carve that time out for them. So I think, for me, last year, I was accepting canvases up till November 1st for a Christmas return. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. But small group, so you keep it under control. Yeah. Small group, invite only. Um, you know, it's what I found works for me. And I have often kind of gone back and forth, you know, is it something I want to offer more broadly? But for me, that quality and that turnaround time is so important that I... I'm a little bit hesitant to open it up larger because I want to guarantee those things. Yeah. 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 The uh, video I watched, I watched a couple of first, I watched the one that Beth watched where you're, (laughs) I'm sure it was your husband cutting open an Amazon package with your stitching scissors. Oh man. Mm -hmm. I I just cringed. (laughs) I laughed. I thought it was hilarious. You send him away. (laughs) I thought that I thought it was funny. I thought it was just yeah, because I I I just keep my scissors hidden. You know, you just mm-hmm. you don't let them find them. And one time, I think my husband did pick up one of my stitching scissors, and I'm like, no, because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was just gonna oh, you know, it was just like it was they were there, and he just picked them up, and I'm like, I'll get you another pair. Those are mine. <laughs> don't touch. <laughs> Hands up. Yep. Hands off. But that was, I thought it was a great video and I thought you guys did a great job on it, um, filming it. And, um, it was hilarious. I just thought it was cute. But... Oh, when, I saw, sweet. when I saw those scissors <laughs> about to cut the tape in an Amazon box, yo, no. <laughs> no. I know. Fortunately, he does know better. It was all for show. So I will reassure you there. He, or, he knows better by now, I should say. Um, <laughs> so the needlepoint scissors are safe. We have, I also strategically ordered like a pack of, I think, 24 like regular scissors. And I put a pair of scissors in every room of the house. So mm. also just taking out motivation to find needlepoint scissors if you can find a regular pair nearby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good move. Good move there. <laughs> yep. Smart. But the one Smart. that really caught me was the one where you're showing how to make cording. And mm-hmm. it wasn't the cording part. It was the fact that that your, your stitching finishing room where you have hooks placed so you can make cording. I thought that was, you know, I never thought about actually 
using the room like that, I guess. Uh, you know, to, the thought of putting hooks into the door frames or whatever you have there, your cabinet. To, and I thought, wow, there, now we're, now we're talking about really making the room work. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I've been very fortunate to always have kind of a stitching designated place in Nashville. Uh, real estate is a little bit more uh, hard to come by than in Kalamazoo. So my stitching room was actually a closet. Um, Kalamazoo, I do have a nice kind of big craft room now, but I definitely you know, I said, this is going to be my stitching room. What do I need to make it as functional as possible? Um, you know, resale value of the, yeah. the home be be ignored. But there are a lot of alternatives, you know, if you don't want to put a hole in the wall, which now that we've moved, I'm a little bit more hesitant to do that. But, you know, you can use clamps and a table. I know a lot of people will actually use their KitchenAid mixers um, and they'll use a dough hook for the cording because the mixer is heavy so it stays still and then the dough hook you know has enough of the curb to catch on to your cording really mm-hmm. oh wow i never <laughs> thought of that i have because i have one of those little cry neck things and i have another one the fancier that um with that does multiple strands mm-hmm. but sometimes you just it's like okay i've got to make a long cord i gotta have something heavy you know, to have the husband hold it and like, okay, don't move. Don't, don't let go. <laughs> well, actually what I prefer now, and I will say most people already have this in their home. They just have to ask their spouse. Um, I use like a pair, like a clamp, um, something similar that you might use in woodworking. And so you can kind of tighten it and I'll just use any table that I have. I'll use the clamp, put the threads under and then tighten it until it's nice and secure and then go from there. Um, and most people actually already have that in their homes. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that too, because you know I have clamps. Hmm. Hmm. No, I, I want I want the video, Beth, where you hook it to the mixer. <laughs> I want that video. Yeah. Yeah that that would be a video. All right. D- dinner's <laughs> on the stove and best twisting cord. I want to see that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that one. Yep. Uh huh. Uh huh. That would be. Yep. That's what we want. That would be. That would be a show. Yeah, and Max in the background rolling his eyes. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So okay. So the I was Beth pointed this out the cricket machine, and Mm -hmm. you know when when you go into Joanne's or Michael's or Hobby Lobby or any of them, you know you see these cricket machines and they're fascinating devices. Don't own one. Don't plan to. But you make pretty good use of that thing. Yes, I probably use it daily um, or at least on days where I am finishing it. I think it's very important to know how to do it by hand. So when I teach classes, I don't involve the cricket. I teach everything, you know, how to do it by hand. But for me, it is such a time saver because I can set the shapes I want, um, the sizes I want press the cut button and then, you know, go make breakfast or whatever. And I come back and my pieces are nicely cut out and ready for finishing. Um, and it is strong enough to cut through. So I use acid free mat board for my finishing. Um, so the knife blade is strong enough to cut through that. And so it's just so easy to, you know, set it, forget it, come back and you've got your boards cut out and ready to go. See, and, 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 this intrigues me because someone has had gifted me a long time ago um, a brother machine, which is like the cricket um, mm-hmm. and the scan and go and scan and cut. And I've never used it for cutting mat board, um, but I have finished small ornaments, especially a heart. And it's always a pain when I'm trying to cut that heart shape smooth. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, well, duh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, scan in my my image of my finished piece and then that will make the size for my mat board Mm -hmm. and cut away my only question is how much how hard is it on those blades so the blade actually I've never replaced mine so it's the same one I bought let's see I've had my Cricut probably for close to five years um and I'm still on that same first knife blade the only thing that I will say it is hard on is the mats that you have to put the material yes. on. 
those have to be cleaned regularly. Um, I'm very fortunate in that my husband will clean them for me because uh, I just hate <laughs> going in there and doing it. <laughs> But I would say that's probably the biggest drawback is they haven't figured out a way for you to cut it without having to use the mat. Right. Right. I understand. And yeah, that's the, that mat, you know, to clean it and to get it sticky again Mm -hmm. or, and then I've, I've done, I saw your little, where you were taping the edges down. Yep. Mm -hmm. We've done that. Yeah. (laughs) So the stuff doesn't slide. Yep. But you know, the maps I think are maybe about $10 each. And so I can definitely use my mat for several weeks at a time. So if you divide that out by the number of pieces that you're able to finish before even cleaning it, I think it more than pays for itself, especially if you're thinking, you know, well, like how much would I be spending on this if I were to send it out for finishing? Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because finishing is expensive, and it, it rightly so, rightly mm-hmm. so, because it, it does take time. If you count the number of hours, you know, you're cutting the mat, you're cutting the fabric, you're cutting the, you're cutting your canvas, okay, mm-hmm. and then you're wrapping it around. However, you're, you know, if you're lacing it, or I, I do glue mine, so I'm going to use the glue word. Um, mm-hmm. If you're gluing it, you know, whatever you're doing, it that all takes a lot of time. Um, It does. And it's very, you have to be very careful, especially, you know, when you're working with someone else's piece, because if you think about it, the amount of time and value of each piece you're working on, that is very high to reimburse. So if you make a single mistake, you know, you're liable for the stitching time, the canvas, the threads. Um, And so, you know, sending it out, you're asking someone to take on that liability as well. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we all, Gary and I have talked about this before, um, because people will say they'll look at a, um, like one of our Gay Ann Rogers hearts and they'll say, oh, that's beautiful. Um, you want, how much would it cost me to buy that? And you're like, no, you don't have that kind of money, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and that's, you know, people just don't understand the amount of time and, and, and money that goes into those. Mm-hmm. And it's not, a, they're not big pieces, you know, what are they? Maybe four inches across, Gary? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're small. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah no, that, but, uh, yeah, that, I'll never forget the time I was, I was in Europe flying home and stitching uh, and a, a flight attendant came up, of course, asking, you know, because male sitting there stitching and uh, do you ever sell those? No, no, no way. <laughs> <laughs> can't get enough money for the hours that go into it. Not a chance. Mm-hmm. No, can't afford it. You just move along. <laughs> just forget mm-hmm. it. <laughs> uh, you got to learn. Got to learn to do it on your own. Yep. But, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm impressed that those those cricket machines. They just don't look like they'd have. You know, to me, they look like they're strong enough to do those fancy greeting cards. But they obviously, especially if you're still using the same blade, can handle some pretty heavy material time after time after time. That's impressive. Yeah, I think, I mean, it can cut up to chipboard. So, you know, if you were doing like cartonage or I think that's what it's called, um, that kind of thicker board, it can even cut that. So it is quite strong. Uh, You do have to buy that special like exacto knife blade. But I think the reason it's able to cut through those materials is it doesn't do it in one cut. So for the mat board, it traces the cut, you know, eight or nine times doing just a little bit more each time. Oh, okay. Huh. Well, I have new respect for cricket machines. <laughs> Still not going to buy one, but um, okay. Oh, you need one, Gary? No, I, no, 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 no. We're not. No, no, no. We're not doing that. Um, I'd get run out of town. Um, <laughs> you got enough stuff. <laughs> All right, a slight diversion here, and then we're going to get back to the finishing. I the boo boo brush that was a new one on me. I thought I had all the goo guys here, but wh- where do I get one? Yeah, so I mean, most uh, local needlepoint stores will have one. I'm pretty sure, oh, honestly, my. if you just Google it, it will pop up as well. Um, but of course, I would say you know, if you can support your local store, um, it's great to do it because I love having you know somewhere I can go and see and touch threads. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're relatively affordable and it just definitely speeds up the process kind of picking up those, you know, random threads that are, 
sometimes maybe a little bit stuck so you don't have to go in with tweezers and pull each single thread. Yeah, for those who don't know, particularly with needlepoint, if you uh, make a mistake and have to take out a section, you, you know, I, I, I always just cut it as much as I can and then pull it out with tweezers, but this thing is just a bristled brush thing that you just roll over the threads and let them snag in the brush and pull out. I, that was completely new to me. But I gotta have one, so all right. I'll look it up. Um, yeah, that's slick. Okay, <laughs> another toy. <laughs> but you know, like, like you want a fun toy so you can clean up your messes. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure I have one, but but where is it? Oh, Probably so you, in the toolbox. You, you've known the... about these? Yeah, I've I've seen them before. Um, and I know because I know I'm pretty sure I have one somewhere in my stash, but I just okay. I don't think about keeping it close by. And I was just thinking I had to pick out some black thread off of black canvas yesterday. And I, I was like, Ooh. this would have been better if I did something else here. Anyway, yeah, that was not Ooh. fun. That sounds like a real pain. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what have you, let's, let's help the people out here, Lita. Uh, what, what have you learned in finishing for people? Uh, you mentioned blocking. Uh, I know I, I work pretty hard with needlepoint to make sure that there isn't any blocking required. Does that, is that a pretty big issue? I wouldn't say it's an issue so much as an extra step. Um, okay. and not all the pieces need blocking. So the way I finish a lot of rounds never need blocking. So even if it comes kind of warped, when I finish and I do kind of this crisscross tension, it kind of blocks it as it's being finished and then it holds it blocked permanently. Uh, it's really more for like squares and funky shapes that I find that blocking is a necessity um, if it does come warped, which they don't all come like that. Um, but I would say, you know, if you can stitch on a frame, th that definitely will help keep your piece a bit straighter. And then... Just general things that are helpful for finishing. Um, you know, if you have detail that's kind of up to the very last stitch of your design, just adding a few extra rows around can really help because it is difficult to get, you know, that exact stitch showing on the front and not any canvas. And so sometimes it might get kind of hidden beneath the cording. And if it's something... Uh, you know, let's say like a Kirk and Bradley round that has those really intricate designs all the way around, you don't want to lose those. So I would say, you know, just add a couple extra rows around in a color kind of similar to the background, and that'll ensure that all of the icons are, you know, going to be showing on the front. Yeah, okay. See, that comes up. You see that in the discussions from time to time. Should, you know, should I add two rows? Should I add three rows? So it's it, you just eyeball it, add, add two or three, just to get enough space away from the design itself then. Yeah. And I think it kind of depends, you know, if it's just um, a round ornament and you've only got background and kind of the design element is right in the center of the piece, but it isn't up to the very edge, then you probably don't need extra rows. But if you do have something where that design element is right on the very edge of your stitching, I would recommend an extra um, couple rows but every finisher is different. I try to save as much as possible, but I also know there are some stitcher or some finishers who request that everything comes with two rows. So um, I would say most important check with your finisher if you can, yeah. because they're going to give you the best guidance for how they finish a piece. And every finisher works a little bit differently and finishes a little bit differently. So for instance, I use acid free mat board, I know there are finishers that use chipboard, other finishers that use acrylic for the insert. So it really just depends on who you're working with and what process they use to finish the pieces. Around the outside, excess canvas, two inches or three inches, or don't care? Um, for me, I would say as long as I have an inch on each side, it's fine. Um, I typically cut it down to probably half an inch anyways. But it depends on how it's being finished. So, for instance, a pillow or like a soft textile finish, you may want to have a little bit more extra canvas. An ornament, you probably don't need more than an inch all the way around. 
Oh, okay. So so that's it's if it's going to be finished flat, you don't need as much. But if there's going to be some some uh, uh, filling in it, and it's going to be more of a softer shape than mm-hmm. flexibility. Okay. Yeah, and I would say you can never give too much. Um, so when in doubt, you know you can always leave a little bit more. But I would say never go less than an inch on each side. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. One of my one of my visions, you know, you have those childhood trauma things that never leave you. Um, I was in a needlework store. This was many years ago now. That did finishing, and someone had had just left a piece to be finished, and the owner was was looking it over, and she gave one of those gasps. And then she flipped because she flipped it over and I could so I could see it in the backside was just a rat's nest. I mean, it was just like, I don't even know how you would finish that without it being all lumpy on the front. And um, uh, and for me, I'm a, I, I freak out about the cleanliness, cleanliness of my back, uh, you know, the back of my uh, pieces. And um, oh, that one was like, hey, I, I don't know. I'm out of here. <laughs> Good luck to you on that one. But uh <laughs> Do, do you, is that really much of a concern? I mean, are most people, uh, their backs are clean enough that you don't have to worry about that? Or is that something people need to pay more attention to in, in what you've seen? Yeah. So for me personally, and I don't want to speak for other finishers, just because I know everyone does it a little bit different. And everybody gets really touchy about it. So yeah. <laughs> Um, It doesn't really impact my finishing because I typically use kind of batting behind the piece. So it's already going to have a little bit um, of cushion. The only thing that I would say is very difficult is if there are big knots on the back. But if it's just like a bunch of threads, typically I can trim off the extra threads and you won't really notice it from the front. But if there are big knots, then sometimes you may notice it. Um, I can still finish it. That's not a problem on my end, but the final result may have a little bump where that giant knot is. So (laughs) everyone, and this again is part of why I love working with a small clientele because I know what their stitching looks like. I know what to expect. And I know that we have an open line of communication. So if something comes through that, you know, could potentially be problematic or maybe wouldn't give them the result that they want. I can text them, let them know, you know, what the issue is before starting and then um, kind of advise them in the future on how to avoid it. But I would say the the really only thing that could potentially be problemsome is if there are giant knots on the back. Um, but even like a small knot doesn't really interfere with my finishing, I would say. Okay, then I can be sloppier. I I think so too and I know so many people their worst fear you know especially starting when they're kind of going from color to color is that they are going to be judged the backs of their canvases and I would hate for someone to be afraid to send something in for finishing or be afraid to start stitching because you know their backs aren't perfect I think you know it's important to strive for progress and maybe not perfection Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that um, I think that's encouraging to people who are just starting. You know, it's it, it doesn't need to be perfect on the back. There's some things, you know, you should try to avoid the, the big knots, the, mm-hmm. you know, maybe carrying something all the way across. It might cause an issue. But if normally if you're just doing trying to be basically neat, it's, it's going to be turn out fine. Yeah. And I would say a lot of finishers can figure out ways to work around it. So, you know, Mm -hmm. if there is a big knot, sometimes they can make sure that the threads all around are really sewn down and then cut that knot off. Um, If you have a lot of extra thread in the back, they'll just, you know, kind of tuck the tails and cut it off. So there are ways around it. Um, It varies by finisher, but I think, you know, as long as you have that open line of communication, um, there is no need to be kind of 100% perfect. Sometimes I'll see the back of someone's canvas and it looks like the front. I can't tell the difference. Um, and I'm always like, yeah, that's that's great. Couldn't be me, but, you know, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> uh-huh. That's the goal, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How do you, 
and, and with a small clientele like that, this you may not come across this, but how do you deal with, say, you get a piece and then the ends start coming out and or or some of the thread is just not quite right? Do you fix it or do you send it back? So typically I will text a person a picture of whatever the issue may be. And I'll say, do you want me to take care of this? Um, is it something you want to take care of? Or, you know, I'm a little worried that this may happen when I go to cut it for finishing. Are you okay with that? Um, so again, just those open lines of communications. But, you know, I get sent pieces all the time that are maybe missing a couple stitches. So I'll just text a person and say, hey, do you want me to fill these in? Um, it doesn't typically take too long, but sometimes... I'll hear back and they said, no, actually, I left those unstitched on purpose. I went to stitch it and I didn't like the way it looked. And so I just honestly preferred the blank canvas right there. Um, So, you know, these are your pieces. It is kind of your discretion how you want things done. But for me, I would say that communication is key. It's helpful Mm -hmm. to have the information of the person I'm finishing for. I can text them. I can just kind of be up front before I start. And I, I would say that's the most important pieces. I would never start something if I wasn't, if I thought there would be an issue, I let them know before. Cause there's nothing worse than being notified after your canvas has been cut into that. <laughs> you know, there's potentially an issue there. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Now see that would not, uh, okay. See, I'd be a terrible finisher. Cause that, it, what are missing stitches? It would not occur to me that that was an artistic license um, thing where they wanted it that way. And uh, yeah, okay, communication always. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you get uh, uh, other than Christmas? Do you have deadlines that you run up against? I mean, do we have birthdays and that kind of thing where you? Yeah. So I mean, I'm pretty flexible. Um, most. Because I work with a small clientele, most of the things I get sent get sent with a no rush note because they know that regardless, it will get back to them before Christmas. And that seems to be what everyone is most concerned about. Um, So if someone needs something back, you know, within the next week or two, they can just text me, overnight it to me, and I can typically get it back to them because I do have flexibility in my finishing order. And so everyone knows They can text me, they can ask me, and they can let me know about important deadlines. Um, And, you know, I can get it back to them relatively quickly because I would say most pieces I can finish within 48 hours if need be. Um, So it's just a matter of, you know, whether I'm I'm home or if I'm traveling, it can be a little bit more difficult. But Mm -hmm. I try to work with my, you know, small group um, to make sure that they have what they need. And in turn they send me more than enough work to keep me busy and I'm able to plan out my life because I have the flexibility in when they need their pieces back. Yeah. Do you have some general guidelines for when people ship you things so that they don't get damaged or lost or is it? Yeah. So the only thing I ask is that it, they send me the tracking number when they ship it. And so then that way I can sit by the door essentially and wait for it on day of delivery um, because my house has many doors, um, FedEx, UPS, and USPS all like to pick a different door on different days. <laughs> <laughs> so it's helpful to have the tracking because I can set up an alert when it, when I see that it's been delivered, I can go out and look for it before it gets caught in the rain or anything like that. Yeah, that, that would be the biggest concern is, is rain. So you uh, tell people to put it inside a plastic bag or wrap it up so it doesn't... Yeah. So I would say that's my biggest advice. Um, I haven't had to tell anyone to do that because almost everyone seems to know to send it in plastic. And what I actually do, because again, I only work with a handful of people, everyone has their own like waterproof project bag. So when I send their pieces back, I tend to send it back in these project bags. And then when they send me new canvases, they send that bag back. And so it's our way of just kind of reducing Um, you know, those Ziploc bags going back and forth and ensuring that the pieces stay waterproof. Um, But then everyone has their own bags. It's kind of coded by name so I can easily look and see whose stuff I have on my shelf that needs to be finished. That's a good idea. That that is a great idea. That's a great idea. Hmm. 
like a like a mail pouch for finishing. Yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then you sent a couple of pictures where you've been teaching some classes. Talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so part of my goal, of course, is to do what I can to bring more people to the hobby. And so in doing that, I've been teaching a lot of just like beginner needlepoint classes. Um, I would say a lot of people are very needlepoint curious. And so um, if I can do it, you know, as a fundraiser or something like that, I'll try to do that. So one of the pictures I sent, it was a fundraiser for a school in Nashville where they offer evening classes. um, And then the funds get turned into scholarships for their students. So that was, I think, the beginner class I taught. And then um, I also just teach generally classes. If someone wants me, I'm more than happy um, to teach it so I can do, you know, intro to needlepoint, intro to ribbon work, um, ornament finishing. I would say those are kind of my main ones. We can also do painting, but I I personally don't enjoy painting, which is why I don't have, you know, lines and lines of beautiful canvases. But um, <laughs> I can teach it if someone wants it. But, yeah, I would say anyone that wants me, um, I am happy to work with. My only thing is, you know, as I mentioned, I – want to support the store as best I can. And so if someone wants a class and let's say they live, you know, within an hour of a store, I would say, Hey, you know, maybe reach out to the store, see if they want to set up the class um, first. And if they don't, then like more than happy to work with you. And of course people also work in or live in needlepoint deserts where there's not a store within, you know, several hours, but I've worked with stores, uh, stitch clubs, needlepoint guilds, really anyone that um, wants my services. I don't discriminate. I think it's neat that you're offering the ornament fish finishing class because that's um, some friends of mine have said, hey, we should get together and do a finishing. I was like, well, you know, I really don't. I mean, I use glue and mine looks a little sloppy and they're like, well, we could do it together. And that would be a great way because the ornaments are fun to do, Mm -hmm. but they are expensive to finish. And it'd be, but it'd be a, it'd be a nice way to get a a group of friends who needlepoint, get, get something finished together and learn how. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I have always been kind of curious because stores will have me come in to teach finishing classes. And I'm always, at first I thought, well, why would they invite me to teach a class? You know, isn't this going to hurt their bottom line? And I think the answer to that is, A, there's such a high demand for finishing that, you know, stores are already kind of struggling to meet the demand for finishers. And B, half the time when someone attends a finishing class, they realize how involved it is, how difficult it is, and they have a new appreciation for sending it out. And so, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they say, oh, I understand why you charge as much as you do. I'm not going to complain about that anymore because I'm so glad I don't have to do it myself. (laughs) Right. and, And I think and I think, too, there's pieces that I would not finish on my own. I just. I just wouldn't. I've spent so much time mm-hmm. stitching the piece um, that I need it. I want it professionally finished. I want it done nicer than I can personally do it. That I'm willing to take the time to do. Some I'm 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 less picky about, you know. Um, yeah. But others I'm very picky about, and I want it done professionally. And mm-hmm. I know I won't take the time to do it. They'll just sit in a box in my basement waiting to be finished. So I might as well send them out to the finishers so they're done. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I'm even guilty of that. I have a probably Ziploc bag of like 20 canvases that I need to finish. I have the skills to do it. It's just not high on my priority list to finish my own stuff when I could be finishing stuff that people sent in and are paying me to finish. Um, So I totally understand. Mm -hmm. Are you able to to control that enough that you can manage your day and get some, uh, some enjoyable stitching time of your own in, or are you finding yourself, uh, like, like your, all your spare time is chewed up finishing? Yeah. So I can control how much work I have, um, via how big my client list is. And yeah. so, 
I have a pretty good idea of what's coming down the pipeline. Um, the people I'm finishing for, they'll send me pictures as they're stitching okay. and they'll, you know, have jokes like, Oh, can't wait to send this to you or, you know, little things like that. Um, so I have a generally good idea of when things are coming in, but because I've limited the amount of people I work with, yeah. it basically is like a nice steady flow. I'm never overwhelmed. Um, and I have a good idea. I think what helps there is I'm not reliant on the finishing funds. And so it's not a situation where I have to, you know, crank out X number each month to, you know, pay my mortgage or anything like that. Right, so right. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility there, but I definitely make sure to not take on so much that I lose my love of needle pointing. <laughs> well, that, that's, and I guess that's what I was trying to get at is, is uh, you can very quickly just have the fun sucked right out of it, and then mm -hmm. you don't want anything to do with any of it. So, yeah, yeah, that can happen. Yep. What's next? Are we just we we happy where we're at, or are you looking to uh, learn some new techniques or try some new finishing things? Yeah. So I always want to learn. Um, I've started working on stand ups and kind of three D finishes. Um, I would love learn how to make like carnage i don't know if i'm pronouncing it right i apologize if i'm not but i'd love to make you know those boxes and kind of integrate needlepoint into that um and i want to get to the point where i can offer more educational services i you know as i mentioned it's very important that for me these things are accessible so i'd like to have some kind of recorded courses that are maybe like a set price um available for purchase and then people can kind of work through them on their own time and then also offer maybe kind of a higher concierge level of assistance where people can kind of book my time and troubleshoot anything that they might be working on um so those i would say are my my future goals but right now i am just continuing to focus on kind of learning what i can and kind of perfecting my finishing yeah. Now you've got a, a decent collection of videos on YouTube and then, uh, it, but it looks like your, your Instagram page is probably where you're most active. I would say so. I try to put, you know, very short, um, instructional or DIY videos. They're all Instagram limited. So it tends to have to be under 90 seconds for most of that. Um, but I think it's helpful for people to have things in bite-sized pieces because I know personally I get overwhelmed with the prospect of an hour-long video. Um, you know, people have busy lives. It's difficult to carve out that much time to do anything, let alone, um, you know, a hobby where there's going to be a lot of maybe cursing and <laughs> mistakes and so. Mm -hmm. nah, we don't do that. cursing. <laughs> Mm -mm. never never yep all right thank you wow lita this is um kind of in, that's a very interesting journey um yeah you've uh accomplished a lot in a short time it's fantastic yep well thank you and so uh we'll be looking for your next line of painted canvases or not <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we never know I, you know patron saint of chaos so i could launch you know 50 canvases tomorrow or i could just shut down and pack everything away so who knows <laughs> oh, don't do that don't do that no no don't do that no. don't do that all right no. she's known as the nashville needle pointer instagram and youtube uh lita thanks so much and thanks to everyone for listening thank you